and say, it's Gus, but I think you know who I am. But I'm definitely bringing you some more theological thoughts and we're continuing our study on how the Trinity developed in Adventism. Today I want to look at E.J. Wagner. Now, he presented his ideas on righteousness by faith at the 1888 Minneapolis General Conference. And in presenting these ideas, the foundation he worked from was that Christ was equal to God and then from there he proceeded to righteousness by faith. Now, his studies, lectures, presentations are recorded in this little book. And I'm not going to go through the whole book. It's going to be a little bit long. But I do want to look at key passages which gives insight into how he saw God's and Jesus' relationship. Now, I will also, in this presentation, quote from Ellen White's writings to show where she agreed and where she disagreed with Wagner. And this is a good thing to keep in mind that we should not assume that Ellen White blanketly supported Wagner or that she was totally against him. I think there's a middle ground that makes a lot more sense. Page 9. The word was in the beginning. The mind of man cannot grasp the ages that are spanned in this phrase. It is not given to men to know when or how the Son was begotten. But we know that he was the divine word, not simply before he came to this earth to die, but even before the world was created. Now, I think it come, becomes clear that Wagner is bringing the argument across that Christ is divine and that he always was divine. There seems to be a little bit of confusion in the way Wagner uses the word begotten in relation to the Son. And we will look at that a little bit later in this presentation. Now, also on page 9, we read, In many places in the Bible, Christ is called God. And yet, Wagner is saying it's biblical to see Jesus as God. And notice not as a God, as God himself. Or as a divine being, perhaps more accurately. Then, on page 16, quote, referencing Colossians 2 verse 9, this is most absolute and unequivocal testimony to the fact that Christ possesses by nature all the attributes of divinity. A little elaboration here on the word nature. When your nature is what is inherently yours, you did not get it from elsewhere. A dog is a dog because that is his nature. That's the genetic makeup. A cat is a cat because by nature it's a cat. I mean, if you suddenly see a cat barking, you're going to think, well, there's something wrong. Nature has been messed with. Because that's not the cat's nature. Let's continue. And so the statement that he is the beginning or head of the creation of God means that in him creation had its beginning. That as he himself says, he is Alpha and Omega. Quoting Revelation here, Wagner is bringing the idea across. He's the beginning. He's the last is divine. And now we come to a bit of an interesting passage in pages 21 and 22. There was a time when Christ proceeded forth and came from God, from the bosom of the Father. But that time was so far back in the days of eternity that to the finite comprehension it is practically without beginning. Now let's first look at the two passages that he references from the Bible as support for this view. And if you go to the King James Version, you'll notice that it uses the word proceeded forth, similar to the words that Wagner uses. If we go to a more modern translation like the SV, it says, I came from God. And basically what that passage is trying to say is not that Jesus popped out of God somehow, but that from his position, where he was next to God as an equal, he proceeded, he came to the earth. John 1 verse 18. Now, in the Old King James, you'll see they use the word bosom. And one must be careful not to take this too literally, because was Jesus literally inside the chest of God, and somewhere along the line he popped out? Now, 
the more modern translation says he was at the father's side and what the imagery is trying to get across is that Jesus the Son of God and God the Father had a very intimate relationship of such intimacy that it's not shared by any other being in the universe none of the angels were in the bosom were that close to God being so enmeshed in each other's planning thinking actions they were outside observers now what's interesting and this is where we find that Ellen White disagrees in Signs of the Times August 29 1900 she writes in speaking of his pre-existence Christ carries the mind back through dateless ages he assures us that there were there never was a time when he was not in close fellowship with the eternal God now you notice what she's saying here there was no time no matter how small you want to make it no matter how far you want to take it back that Jesus was not in close fellowship with the Father so there wasn't 10 seconds or 10 minutes where Christ was not there or not in close fellowship as God is eternal so Christ the Son of God was eternal and in close fellowship with the Father that's what Ellen White's saying on this part on page 22 Wagner writes and since he is the only begotten Son of God he is of the very substance and nature of God and possesses by birth all the attributes of God. For the Father was pleased that his Son should be the express image of his person. So he has life in himself. He possesses immortality in his own right and can confer immortality upon others. Life inheres in him so that it cannot be taken from him but having voluntarily laid it down, he can take it again. Now, there's a lot of things in that paragraph but let's start with the word substance and Ellen White in Signs of the Times November 27 1894 writes as Jesus said I and my father are one the words of Christ were full of deep meaning as he put forth the claim that he and the father were of one substance possessing the same attributes now both are using the word substance and both have the idea that Jesus and the Father have the same attributes. Now if I can explain it like this, if I have a glass of water and another glass of water, they have the same substance. They both have water because it has the same attributes. If the one is water and the one is oil, they're not of the same substance because they don't have the same attributes. Now when we go back, this word substance actually has a long history and comes from the Nicene Creed, which reads, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made. So they, they don't disagree on this point, this one substance. Now you will have noticed and I'm, that there seems to be a bit of confusion because on the one side, Wagner says Christ is divine, he has the same attributes as God, he's of the same substance. Um, he also says on page 21, he, speaking of Christ, is above all creation and not a part of it. But then on the other side, he uses words like only begotten, birth, and by birth he gets the same substance and nature of God. So there seems to be a little bit of a confusion of which way Wagner is actually leaning. Now, we must understand here, when we say Christ is of the same substance, he has the attributes of God, then Christ is eternal because he has the same qualities as God. And if you use the word begotten, it's better understood as revealed. If you say to me, Christ is of a different substance, then Christ was created. And Christ can only have similar qualities to God by inheritance, right? So he had, he had to receive them. And then you must use the word begotten, meaning he was created. Now, I'm going to fall back here on Ellen White again, and from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 36, we read, The King of the universe summoned the heavenly host before him, that in their presence he might set forth the true position of his Son, 
and show the relation he sustained to all created beings. The Son of God shared the Father's throne and the glory of the eternal self-existent one encircled both. Now in that short paragraph, Alan White is saying that there was a time when the created universe wasn't aware who Jesus truly was. Right? They saw this being and what they understood, I don't know. But at a certain stage, God the Father comes and says, I want to reveal to you that this being whom you've seen is actually my son. He is equal to me. Now, what Alan White's talking about here is not being brought forth, not being created, but being revealed. When you look at Wagner's writing, you discover there's another little flaw that pops up. Wagner argues that Christ was divine by birth. So in some way, Christ received divine attributes and that made Christ just like God, divine. When we go to Jesus' human nature, he became human by birth. By being born, he received human attributes and that made him just like man. And in Wagner's thinking, it means sinful. And once again, when we take this further, we have agreement and disagreement between him and Ellen White. The point of disagreement is this. Ellen White, in Manuscript 42, written in 1901, writes, Having taken human nature, and in this nature having overcome the temptations of the enemy, and having divine perfection, to him has been committed the judgment of the world. You see, Ellen White says, Christ remains sinless in his, divine, uh, in his human nature, not his divine nature. Yes, he was divine, but he didn't rely on that divine power. He relied on his humanity and being empowered by the Father. When we turn to Wagner on page 29, he says, He was compassed with infirmity, yet he did no sin, because of the divine power constantly dwelling within him. So Wagner is reasoning that Christ was sinful, but he didn't sin because the divine nature somehow overrode the human nature and that prevented Christ from sinning. So as you can see, here's a point where they disagree. A point where they do agree, we find in Desire of Ages, where Ellen White writes, Only he who is one with God could say, I have power to lay down my life and I have power to take it again. In his divinity, Christ possessed the power to break the bonds of death. And Wagner, on page 44, writes, If he lacked one iota of being equal to God, he could not bring us to him. Divinity means having the attributes of deity. Nothing is ever so clear-cut, black and white, as we'd like it to be. And we can see here that Wagner was presenting certain ideas, saying Christ is divine, he's equal to the Father which if we look at some of the early pioneers and some of the ideas there, that was contradictory. He didn't have his whole theology ironed out. There were little flaws here and there and things like, but Wagner, this is not making sense. It contra you're contradicting yourself. And what we find is that Alan White was supporting some of the ideas, but there's certain ideas which he contradicts and says, no, it's not this way, it's that way. What is important, though, is that Wagner, in 1888, pushed the church in a direction where they could study the divinity of Christ. And when they studied that, they said, wait, we've got to go to the Holy Spirit. We need to study that. And that led to the acceptance of the Trinity. Remember to subscribe, because there's more interesting and amazing things coming.